Hi everyone, welcome back to Learn With Me. I'm Deborah Hansen. Today we're gonna to look at AP Psychology 4.7 Emotion. But before we get started, I always like to say thank you so much to everybody who's liked and subscribed and commented on my channel. It's been really helpful and the numbers are going up and I just absolutely love to see it. And I love to see the comments as well and answer them as well. So hopefully you're finding this helpful. If you do and you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button for me and the like button. And if you have any questions, make sure you put them down below. You'll also find the link below to the full unit four slideshow with the key terms, the study notes, the workbook, and the whole slideshow. So that'll bring you to my teacher P teacher store where you can see all the units, unit one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, let's get started. On this slide, you're going to see the key terms for unit 4.7 emotion. And this is for the two CD questions. There are two for this section of unit four. I'm going to do two separate videos, CD question one and CD question two. There's also a separate video for just the key terms. Now, obviously those key terms will be in embedded into all the discussions and essential knowledge we're going to talk about during this video, but you'll find there's a separate video just with the words definition, example, definition, example. I always say key terms are the key to the five. It really is so important for you to memorize the key terms and then to be able to apply them to your MCQs and your FRQs. So super important. I don't care how you do it. If you do like old fashioned flashcards, like I really like to do, or if you're using Quizlets or just writing them in your notebook, however you do it, it, whatever you do, you have to memorize them. So the first CD question that we're going to look at is explain how theories of emotion apply to behavior and mental processes. So in this video, I'm going to go through all the essential knowledge that you need to know to answer this question. We'll start off with an introduction to theories of emotion. So emotion is a complex psychological process that's influenced both by the internal our physiological and external our cognitive and environmental factors. So we're going to look at all the details associated with that. Let's start by talking about emotion. What is it? How does it work? And why is it such an important part of psychology? Emotion is a psychological response made up of three key parts. One, physiological arousal. That's the changes in your body, like an increased heart rate or sweating. The second one is cognitive appraisal. How you label and interpret the situation. Am I scared? Am I excited? Am I angry? And lastly, the behavioral response. What do you do? Like a facial expression, a scream, or whatever action that you respond to that emotion. So let's break it down with an example. Imagine you hear a loud noise in a dark alley. Your heart races. That's the physiological arousal. You think, I'm in danger. That's the cognitive appraisal. And then you jump back or you run away. That's the behavioral response. So together, these make up the emotion we call fear. Emotions are essential because they influence everything we do, from making decisions to building relationships. They also help us respond to threats, challenges, and opportunities in our environment. So let's recap that. Emotion is made up of physiological arousal, cognitive appraisal, and behavioral response. Emotions like fear, joy, or anger guide how we think, we feel, and we act. And that's emotion in a nutshell. Whether it's fear, excitement, or love, emotions, that's what makes us human. Let's look at early theories of emotion, how psychologists have tried to explain the connection between our thoughts, feelings, and our bodily reactions. So we're gonna break it down. Let's start with the big debate. Does emotion come from the body? or the mind. And early theories of emotion focus on the relationship between physiological responses like your racing heart and cognitive labeling like recognizing fear. There are two ways these theories explain emotion. One, sequential theories. First, your body reacts, then your brain catches up to label the emotion. For example, you see a bear, your heart races, and then you think, I'm scared. Or second is simultaneous theories. Your body and brain respond to this at the same time. So for example, you see the bear and both your fear and racing heart happen together. So understanding these early theories help us explore how emotions guide our behaviors and decision making. So do we react first and think later? Or do we feel emotions and then bodily responses at the same time? So psychologists have studied these questions to understand the link between our brains and our bodies. So let's recap that. Some theories suggest emotions arise sequentially. First, the body reacts, then the brain labels. Others propose emotions arise simultaneously with body and mind reacting at the same time. So that's a quick look at the early theories. Next, next time you feel scared or excited or happy, think about what was happening first. Was it your body? Or your mind. Cognitive labeling is the process of interpreting or labeling your physiological response to understanding what emotions you're feeling. So in other words, your brain takes the signals from your body and decides, am I scared? Am I excited? Am I nervous? This is called cognitive appraisal. Let's look at an example. Imagine your 
heart's racing. You're on a roller coaster. You label the feeling as excitement because the context is fun and thrilling. But in a dark alley, you label the same racing heart as fear because the context feels dangerous. The physical reaction is the same, but how you interpret it changes everything. So cognitive label is critical because it shapes how we react to situations and manage our emotions. It explains why the same physical reaction, like a racing heart, can feel completely different in different contexts. So without labeling, we'd struggle to fully understand or communicate what we're feeling. Let's recap. Cognitive labeling helps us understand our emotions by interpreting our body's signals. The same physiological response can feel excitement, fear, or something else entirely based on the context. And that's how cognitive labeling works. So next time your heart's racing, think about how the context influences your emotion. Let's talk about facial feedback hypothesis. This is the idea that your facial expressions don't just reflect your emotions, but they can actually influence how you feel. Let's break this down. The facial feedback hypothesis suggests that your facial expressions can influence your emotional experience. So when you smile, your brain gets a signal that can make you feel happier, even if you weren't happy to begin with. So here's some fun examples. Research shows that even forcing a smile, like holding a pencil between your teeth to mimic the muscles used for smiling, can actually boost your mood. Want to try that? Okay, so if you're having a bad day, try smiling. It might just help. This hypothesis supports the idea that physiological experiences like facial expressions can come before you consciously label or appraise your emotions. So in other words, your body might influence your feelings before your brain fully processes them. Research on the facial feedback hypothesis has kind of mixed results. Some studies found that smiling really does make people feel happier. Others suggest that facial expressions might not always influence emotions as much as we think. So while the idea is fascinating, it's still being studied and debated. So let's recap. The facial feedback hypothesis says your facial expressions can influence how you feel. Smiling might make you happier, and frowning might deepen your sadness. So research is ongoing, but it's a great reminder that small actions can make a big difference in how we feel. So next time you're feeling down, try smiling might help lift your mood. Now let's look at the broaden and build theory of emotion. This was developed by Barbara Fredrickson, and it highlights the adaptive role of emotions in shaping behavior and thought. So here's an expanded view of the theory. We're going to look at positive emotions and negative emotions. Let's start with positive emotions. So positive emotions such as joy, gratitude, and interest expand an individual's awareness and encourage explore, exploration, learning, and creativity. The effects of that are they promote open-mindedness. It builds social bonds and relationships foster skills, resources, and resilience over time. So for example, feeling joy might inspire someone to take up a new hobby or join a social group or embark on a creative project. This in turn builds their personal and social resources, enhancing well-being in the long run. Now let's look at negative emotions. Negative emotions like fear, anger, or sadness tend to narrow focus, emphasizing immediate action or survival strategies. So the effects are trigger-specific and goal-directed behaviors. They limit cognitive flexibility to deal with immediate threats. For example, feeling anger might result in concentrating solely on resolving the source of frustration, such as fixing a problem at work or addressing a perceived injustice. So this theory suggests that while positive emotions broaden our perspectives and build lasting resources, negative emotions serve as a purpose in managing immediate challenges that may be constrain thinking and limit future growth opportunities. So now let's talk about how emotions influence our behavior and mental processes. Remember, that was our CED question. So think about a time when you feel you felt really scared or really happy. Did it change the way you acted or the way you thought about things? Let's break this down. First, let's look at behavioral influences. Emotions are like guides for our actions. For example, if you feel fear, your body might prompt you to run away or avoid a dangerous situation. On the other hand, if you feel happiness, you might feel more motivated to spend time with your friends, smile more, or even try something new. It's like our emotions give us a little nudge on what to do next. So now let's look at mental processes, how emotions affect our thoughts. When you feel anxious, for example, have you ever noticed how your mind can get stuck in a loop of overthinking? I know it happens to me. That's your emotions influencing your mental processes. But on the flip side, when you're excited, your brain might focus on all the positive possibilities, making you feel more optimistic and ready to take on challenges. So here's a quick example. 
Imagine you have a big test tomorrow. If you feel anxious, it might lead to overthink and second guess every single answer while you're studying. But if you feel excited about showing off what you know, that might help you focus better and think more clearly. So emotions are very powerful. They don't just make us feel things. They actually shape how we act and how we think. And understanding this can help us recognize how emotions might be influencing our decisions, our actions, and how we approach challenges. What do you think? Can you think of a time where your emotions changed how you acted or thought about something? Put that down in the comments if you have. So we've been talking a lot about the theories of emotion, but let's see how they apply to real life. Emotions aren't just abstract concepts. They have practical uses in education, the workplace, and even therapy. Let's have a look at that. First, let's start with education. Imagine being in a classroom where you feel happy, encouraged, and supported. Those positive emotions don't just make you feel good, they actually enhance your creativity and engagement. And for example, a teacher using humor or fun activities might make it easier for you to think outside the box or to participate in class discussions. On the other hand, if you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, it can block those creative and critical thinking processes. And that's why creating a positive emotional environment is so important in schools. Next, think about the workplace. Emotions play a huge role in how productive and effective we are at work. For instance, if someone knows how to manage stress, they're likely to stay focused and complete their tasks more efficiently. Similarly, emotions like excitement can be motivating, helping you tackle big projects with enthusiasm. Understanding and managing emotions also helps build better relationships with coworkers, which can mean fewer conflicts and a more supportive, supportive work environment. And finally, let's look at therapy. Have you ever noticed how emotions can feel tied to physical sensations? For example, when you're anxious, your heart might race, your palms might sweat. And this connection between physiological arousal and emotional labeling is key in therapy. A therapist might help a person with anxiety recognize and reframe those physical responses. Instead of thinking, my heart is racing because something terrible is about to happen, they might learn to say, my heart's racing because I'm excited or nervous, but I'm okay. And this helps people better understand and manage conditions like anxiety and depression. So emotions are everywhere, at school, at work, in therapy. By applying what we know about emotion theory, we can create better learning environments, more effective workplaces, and healthier ways to cope with challenges. What do you think? Can you see how understanding emotions might help you in your own life? So before we end the video, let's summarize all the theories of emotions that we've learned. Emotions arise from interplay of physiological responses and cognitive appraisal. Theories differ in whether physiological and cognitive aspects occur sequentially or simultaneously. Facial feedback hypothesis suggests that facial expressions influence emotions but has mixed research support. And lastly, broaden and build theory. Positive emotions broaden awareness, awareness while negative emotions narrow focus. So that's all the essential knowledge that you need to know for 4.7 emotion. And it was the CED question, explain how theories of emotion apply to behavior and mental processes. I'm going to put a question down in the comments below and see if you can answer it. And that would be great to hear what you're thinking. And as well, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. It really does help me a lot. And I love to see the numbers go up. So hit that subscribe, the like, and add that comment. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.